These are the second set of slides for this week, speaking specifically about the immune system. Remember, in the first set of slides, we talked about what causes disease, and now we're going to start thinking about what our body does to protect us from disease and also deal with it when we uh, come into contact with different pathogens, so when they get past different defense mechanisms that we have. In case you skipped the other lecture, I just wanted to remind you that there are some kind of changes and announcements about the lecture schedule. Remember that uh, last week we had the lab practical, and so uh, we had the week off from lecture, and again, that was time off from lecture for you to do self-guided study for the practical. Um, I don't uh, I didn't have a copy of the practical ahead of time for that, so I wasn't able to participate in preparing you. Um, I'll make sure that there's kind of specific stuff throughout the next set of lectures to help prepare you for the next practical. Um, but in general, when I give you time off, it's for you to, you know, practice time management and have a week off from assignments and study on your own pace. Um, I also want to point out that in lab recently, uh, you covered a few different systems and we're going to spend some time unpacking those systems over the next few weeks. Um, when we cover material at different paces, I'm not trying to trick you or confuse you. Material and biology really does build on itself, so it's not going to fit nicely into one week or the other. Um, so when you see material that doesn't Quite match up between lab and lecture. It's not to make things more complicated for you, it's just to give you multiple opportunities to kind of see and integrate that material. Um, and so then it doesn't lose, or you don't lose it from your mind, you don't kind of let it float away anyway. Um, and then also we're going to be switching the order of weeks eight and nine. So next week in lab or this coming week, um, you're going to be talking about energy requirements and metabolism. So I'll supplement that by talking about the digestive system and the endocrine system. Um, and then the following week, we'll talk about the nervous system. So we're gonna switch eight and nine. I've already switched those modules on Canvas. Um, so the material will be uploaded accordingly. Um, the endocrine system you should probably learn about before you talk about homeostasis and the nervous system will help supplement that lab as well. So again, lab is remaining constant, lecture is the only one that's getting switched. And then in case you skipped it, um, all of the statements on the last reflection were false. So they represent common misconceptions people have about the cardiovascular system. There is a full answer key on the Lecture A PowerPoint and um, lecture that's posted to Canvas. So please make sure you review those if you answered true for any of them because those are all false. Okay, so again, um, that first lecture that we posted for this week uh, was about the different uh, pathogens or disease causing things um, that affect human bodies. So they uh, think these are things that cause disease in humans. And this lecture is going to focus on our immune system. So how our body stops pathogens from getting inside of us. And then once it's there inside of us, how do we deal with those pathogens? So we're going to start out by talking about innate immunity and then get into adaptive immunity, which involves antibodies. So we're going to kind of combine those two sections together and very briefly talk about examples of disruptions in the immune system. So for innate immunity, you should focus on what are the components of the first line of defense that stop pathogens from getting in in the first place, and the second line of defense where if pathogens do get in, um, how are some uh, non-specific ways that we deal with those. For adaptive immunity, you should compare and contrast humoral and cellular immunity um, and think about how it can be active, passive, natural, and artificial. You should also know some general features about antibodies and be able to contrast those with antigens. Um, and then you should focus on this idea of allergies versus autoimmunity for the last section. The study guide for the upcoming quiz is already posted, so it might be worth looking over that to help focus your attention even further. So we'll start out by talking generally about what we mean by immunity and the immune system. So when we're talking about immunity, we're talking about this system throughout our body um, that's very complicated and messy, but provides us some level of resistance. So basically it's the ability of our body to get rid of disease, either stop it from happening or stop us from getting sick as a result of foreign invaders. So these are caused by microbes, microbial byproducts, so different materials that they produce, that's gonna be important, or the environment. 
Um, and it's tricky because this self versus non-self, this idea that there's a foreign invader in our body, is really important because if we're not able to recognize that, we can end up attacking our own cells um, or maybe responding to way too much if it's a super sensitive distinction. Um, the opposite of immunity is susceptibility. So if we're susceptible to something, we don't have resistance against it. So again, this is a very messy, complex system that really incorporates many other systems. It's what we call a super system. So it involves stuff like our tonsils, which actually kind of incorporate in pathogens and allow us to kind of learn information about them. It includes our lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes that drain interstitial fluid and um, provide another kind of level of circulation in our body. It involves our spleen and our bone marrow where stuff is synthesized as well as our thymus where important cells kind of are grown and developed and matured. Um, the kidney is very important for sensing and responding to different things um, and homeostasis. Um, and then there's our whole microbiome which is also involved. So it's a very complex system. So our body actually relies on both innate and adaptive immune responses to keep out pathogens. By innate, we mean basically what we're born with, with no specific targeting of particular bacteria or viruses. Um, so these are primary lines of defense that are present at birth and they're nonspecific. So for example, when you get a vaccine that is preparing your body to be protected against a very particular bacterium, innate immunity is something like your skin, which is just generally keeping stuff out without targeting anything in particular. So this is kind of like an early warning system. It's not just something very basic like our skin. There's also kind of bigger responses that we'll talk about as part of innate immunity. So there's also adaptive immunity, which as the name suggests, is our body adapting to foreign invaders being present and learning from that and growing as a result. So these are acquired and actually quite stronger immune responses that we gain based on how we learn to recognize specific microbes. So this is the memory component of immunity. So when we're thinking about the immune system, there's very particular cells, particularly white blood cells, different leukocytes that play a role in innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Um, something that I want to note here is that in the lab, you should have looked at a smear of blood that included different types of granulocytes and agranulocytes. And there should have been a question on the worksheet about that. Um, I posted a resource to Canvas with different microscopic images um, of different types of cells with kind of labeling. So for the different granulocytes, which are basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, there's kind of details about how to recognize those under the microscope. Um, for the agranulocytes, um, so the monocytes and lymphocytes, which include B cells and T cells, uh, there's also a resource there. Um, so please make sure you look at that as you're studying for the practical. We really want you guys to get practice looking at microscope slides and recognizing structure and inferring function. Um, here, there's kind of a, a lot of overlapping terms in this adaptive immunity as well as the in-between area. Um, remember that when we're talking about agranulocytes, um, Again, those include the monocytes and the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are then further divided into B lymphocytes, which can differentiate into plasma cells, uh, T lymphocytes, which are also called T cells, and natural killer cells. So we have kind of different classifications at play here based on how they look under a microscope um, and then also kind of what their functional role is. So again, the immune system works as a super system. There's a lot of different um, systems at play here, interacting with one another and keeping your body healthy, which we'll see especially in innate immunity. So when we're talking about innate immunity, this is two different lines of defense. The first line of defense stops stuff from getting in. The second line of defense is nonspecific reactions after stuff has already gotten into our body. So that first line of defense are the different physical and chemical factors of skin and mucous membranes, as well as the healthy bacteria that are living on our body and kind of colonizing that space. Um, the second line of defense are things like phagocytes, with, which consume uh, bacteria and viruses. 
um, inflammation, so inflammatory responses, fever, and different antimicrobial agents. And again, those are targeting bacteria, viruses, fungi very broadly, not any in specifically um, in reaction to having seen them before. So our first line of defense, the one that's most important for preventing stuff from getting into our body is our skin. Um, and so we have these uh, layers of, of different cell types. Um, we have the layers of tissue. Um, there's all these dry cells that are constantly sloughing off, um, as well as keratin uh, to kind of keep things tough and contained. Um, and so our skin is very important for preventing stuff from getting into our body. If we get cuts or lesions, different things like that, uh, it's very likely that it will get infected. Um, and if we have burns where large portions of our skin are damaged, uh, there's a lot of immune cell reactions to that later on, but that is also uh, a very high risk for getting pathogens into our body. So like I mentioned, the dead cells that are at the top of our skin and keratin are very dry and they're constantly um, kind of falling off our body, which has this mechanism of removing microbes. So even if bacteria kind of get into those top layers of the skin, they're constantly being shed and so that kind of helps get rid of bacteria. So a tricky thing that uh, you can think about is uh, what happens if you're in a very tropical or humid environment. So if you think about like being in a locker room um, where there's a lot of showers, a lot of people walking around barefoot, uh, one thing that you might think about is athlete's foot, which is a fungal disease. So when you are in these very wet locations, these tropical or humid environments, um, different fungi produce compounds that are actually able to break down keratin. They hydrolyze the keratin, meaning they use water and enzymes to kind of break it apart. Um, and so then they create these openings in our skin and they're better able to infect us. So that's why something like athlete's foot is more of a problem um, in locker rooms. So in addition to our skin, we have mucous membranes throughout um, these kind of open passageways in our body um, and our airways specifically as we're breathing in. Uh, one thing you might not know is that there's tons of bacteria just floating around and fungal spores. Um, every day we inhale thousands and thousands of fungal spores. It's only usually an issue if you're immunocompromised, um, but in general, we're constantly breathing in stuff that could be pathogenic. So it's important to breathe through your nose, first of all, because your nose hairs are really effectively able to trap large particles before they get to your lungs. And then in your lungs, you have what's called a ciliary escalator. So the cells that line your lungs and those different airways have cilia on them on what's called the apical side of the cell. And so those cilia are kind of like dancing and wiggling around and they're moving kind of like an escalator to move dust and microbes back up and out of your body. There's also physical barriers. Um, when you dissected the fetal pig, you should have looked at the epiglottis or at least talked about it. Um, the epiglottis is really cool. In case you don't know what it is, um, you should try humming. And then as you're humming, try swallowing. So what happens is uh, you have air going through your trachea to hum, um, and then when you swallow, you block that and then uh, allow the opening to go through your esophagus. So when you have stuff going down the wrong pipe, it's because you had a mismatch in your epiglottis and you let something through into the wrong pipe where it shouldn't have gone. Um, and so the epiglottis is important for controlling flow between our trachea and our esophagus. And it also helps prevent pathogens from getting into our body. Um, so you don't want food getting into your trachea that can cause pretty serious infections. Um, we also have earwax and ear hairs. Um, so those are important for stopping pathogens from getting in. There are all kinds of videos on earwax you can watch on YouTube if you wanted to, and I have chosen not to include them here, but you can see just how effective earwax and hairs are at stopping nasty stuff from getting into your body. So in addition to kind of physical structures, um, there's the physical action of fluids. So we have lots of fluids throughout our body um, and a lot of these tracts are very effective at producing fluids and cleaning them out. 
Um, so for example, urine is very important for clearing uh, different bacteria out of our urethra. When we talk more about the excretory system and kidneys, that'll make a little bit more sense. Um, but that's why it's, you know, a lot of people don't know that it's very important to pee after you have sex. The reason for that is that the urine and that mechanism of action um, really makes sure that you don't have any bacteria going up your urethra and causing UTIs. Uh, people with vaginas are especially sensitive to that because uh, you have a much shorter urethra than someone with a penis. Um, so sorry for dropping all that knowledge on you right now, um, but a lot of people have misconceptions about vaginal secretions also. So uh, I don't know if you guys are old enough to have really listened to the Spice Girls, um, but there's a Spice Girl called Mel B, um, and she was in the news recently, uh, earlier this year, um, because she said that she, you know, had been traumatized by her ex. Um, she didn't want any trace of him on her body anymore, so she had her vagina scraped. Um, so that represents a lot of misconceptions that people have about the vagina in general. It is a self-cleaning organ, so it's constantly you know, shedding and secreting different fluids um, to keep things very clean and balanced. And so a lot of people you know, add different substances, they kind of scrape in different ways to feel like they need to be clean. All that's doing is introducing openings for bacteria to infect them and throwing their very natural and balanced system out of whack. Um, and I think it's also more important for people to get the mental health and support they need and not be shamed in this process. But um, this, you know, was just really dangerous because she obviously is influential for a lot of people. Um, and so this is something that you don't really want to allow to continue. And really, it's unethical as a clinician to kind of practice stuff like that um, and really take people's money just because they're traumatized. Um, another thing uh, in our tracts or the GI tracts or our gastrointestinal tract, um, when we swallow, stuff is kind of moving through our body. That's also happening in our gut. So things like defecation and vomiting and diarrhea with smooth muscle action um, are a way to get stuff out of our body um, so that it doesn't infect us. Tears are another way to kind of wash different bacteria out as well as saliva. So these, again, this physical action of fluids removes microbes and prevents them from sitting around and colonizing our body. Um, and then another thing to note, all of those are also uh, pretty acidic. So most secretions in our body tend to kind of be a little bit more acidic. Um, so that means that there's also a chemical component there. Uh, those physical structures are kind of able to um, change the environment around the bacteria and make it less hospitable to them. For example, uh, this is not pH related, but our skin is also very salty. So that limits the types of bacteria that can live there. In the last lecture, we talked a little bit about the microbiome. That's this whole world of amazing microbes, um, different bacteria and fungi and protists and all sorts of stuff that are found on our body um, at all times, but they're even there before birth. So some are present in utero, in the uterus, others colonize an infant following a vaginal birth. Um, and so one thing that's also kind of cool is if you have a C-section, you can do a vaginal swab. Um, so the doctor will swab the vaginal area and wipe it over the infant's face to mimic that transfer of microbiome, um, like what happens in a vaginal birth. Um, another cool thing is that uh, there are uh, fecal transplants that can be done. If people have pretty serious ongoing gut issues, they can basically get a poop pill from someone with a healthy uh, gut microbiome, and that has been shown. There's some evidence that that helps um, restore a healthy gut microbe balance and keep you healthy. Um, and then throughout the next few years of life, as infants, you know, grow and eat more stuff and get exposed to the world around them, their microbiome starts changing. And it does change uh, throughout our lives as we undergo different environmental and physical conditions. So that micro microbiome is very important because, like I mentioned in the last lecture, it stops colonization um, from different dangerous pathogens. Um, so it's healthy, it's good for us, it, you know, is kind of like the normal set of things. And if uh, bacteria are living in our body in a way that's positively symbiotic with us, 
then they're taking up space and resources so that there's no room for transient microbes, which we kind of pick up over the course of our day, which might be pathogenic. So they kind of keep this healthy baseline so that we don't get sick. So sometimes, even though we have all of these mechanisms to protect our body, pathogens do get through that first line of defense where they might start to en uh, encounter blood. Um, that blood has plasma in it, it's circulating around, it also has formed elements, um, so it has cells and cell fragments. So I want to kind of talk about different types of cells that are present um, and also kind of talk about different reactions, thinking about the signals that are released from those different um, pathogens and how those signal our body to respond. So when we're looking at this, there's a lot of information here. Um, I think that we've talked about stem cells before, but just so uh, you remember, stem cells are cells that can divide and become many types of cells. So in this case, these are multipotent hematopoietic stem cells. That is a way of saying that this is a stem cell that can go on to become any type of blood cell specifically. So it can't become any cell in our body. It can't become muscle or bone or neurons but it can become any type of blood cell. So what happens is it divides, it replaces the stem cell, and then the other cell that is produced through division uh, goes on to become a different type of blood cell. So it's able to differentiate. It might end up as a red blood cell. It might end up as a uh, granulocyte. It might end up as an agranulocyte. It might end up um, as any sort of thing. Um, and then it also could end up as a bunch of fragments, which are those platelets. So there's um, white blood cells, which we talked about when we were talking about the cardiovascular system. Those are called leukocytes. Remember, leukocyte is just a fancy way of saying white blood cell. Um, so these are formed elements, they're cells uh, that are involved in innate immunity in some ways. Um, so Again, their group names are based on their staining characteristics. The granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils have little dots on them. Those are the granules. A granulocytes, so A means not, um, do not have granulocytes. They don't have, uh, they don't have granules in their cells. So those are things like monocytes, which are phagocytotic, and lymphocytes, which are important for um, uh, different parts of adaptive immunity, so they're able to secrete antibodies or perceive antibodies. Um, they're the memory component. So again, I posted that uh, resource that has a bunch of the different blood smears and labeled micrographs or pictures taken through a microscope of the different blood cells, but here's an example so that you can see platelets, neutrophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes, um, as well as monocytes, and kind of see how they look different from one another. In general, leukocytes tend to be quite a bit bigger than red blood cells, though lymphocytes are kind of more similar in size to those red blood cells. So again, uh, granulocytes are granular. They have granules. Agranulocytes are much smoother. Um, but like I mentioned, or like it says there, um, they can have dark portions even though they're not uh, technically granular. So you can see the lymphocyte looks very dark. Um, it might be easy to confuse that darkness with something like the eosinophil, which has tons and tons of granules and a lobed nucleus. So the lymphatic system, I kind of briefly mentioned, is separate from but linked to the circulatory system. Um, so whereas the circulatory system is moving blood through the body and interchanging with body tissues, um, the lymphatic system is important for draining the interstitial fluid that is uh, floating between our body cells and circulating it back to the heart. So eventually the lymphatic system and lymphatic vessels hook up with the circulatory system and drain into our heart through the vena cava. Um, but all these different components are very important for moving and forming different formed elements that are in blood. Um, they're also important for adaptive immune response.
So again, we're kind of continuing this trend of thinking about um, these primary lines of defense, specifically uh, the second line of defense after bacteria have gotten into our body. So if bacteria get past our um, nasal passageways, if they get past our skin, if they get into our body in some way, uh, they can be taken care of using phagocytosis, which is when a phagocytotic cell is able to ingest and break down a microbe or a dangerous pathogenic substance. So not every white blood cell can undergo phagocytosis or can you know, perform phagocytosis, but all phagocytes, which are cells that can undergo and do phagocytosis, are white blood cells. So not every white blood cell can do this, but all the ones that can do it are white blood cells. And these can also um, migrate or emigrate through uh, different internal epithelial tissues. So they're able to kind of circulate through our bloodstream. They receive different chemical signals. They're able to move towards those chemical signals that are telling you, hey, there's an infection over here. They start to kind of interact with the cells that are lining our blood vessels and squeeze through them, and they make their way to that infection. Um, so those are the wandering um, uh, phagocytotic cells, the wandering white blood cells. They kind of move around through tissue. Uh, some white blood cells kind of stay fixed in place at a particular tissue site or organ, um, so they just hang out there. So some of them wander around through the circulatory system um, or through the lymph, others stay in place. So when we're thinking about phagocytosis, there's a couple different steps that are involved. You do not need to memorize these steps, but in general, there's this idea of chemotaxis. So the phagocytotic cell is receiving some sort of chem chemical signal that's encouraging it to move towards the pathogen, which is what we see in this white blood cell chasing a bacterium. So there's the positive chemotaxis movement towards that pathogen. Um, it's able to adhere to the pathogen and then engulf it and surround it and eventually break it down. So phagocytosis is nonspecific. There's no memory component, um, but it is important for once something does get past our skin or our primary lines, uh, first lines of defense, um, this is a good nonspecific response. Another thing our body can do is um, produce a fever. So this is an abnormally high body temperature. Um, what happens is bacteria, like we talked about, have different components in their cell walls um, and so uh, when, or in their cell membranes as well. Um, and certain types of bacteria, when our cells break them down, so when a macrophage comes and breaks open that cell, they release um, different chemical signals, including cytokines, um, and then or they cause the production of cytokines from our white blood cells. So we have this cytokine cascade um, or signaling response. Um, those cytokines, those important chemical signals, are sent in our blood vessels and they eventually reach our brain and that tells our brain to produce a fever. So it basically changes the temperature settings in our body um, and causes a fever. So while we don't think about fevers as being particularly comfortable or good, they are doing something important. They're, you know, activating our immune system. They're producing an environment that's not great for the bacteria. Um, so it's worse for the bacteria than it is for us. So those cytokine signals do a lot of stuff. They can also cause inflammation, um, which is very important for stopping the bacteria where they are. They, it limits the spread of infection. Um, it might kill the bacteria, and then it helps promote healing by kind of having this increased blood flow um, so that our body can heal itself. So remember, we had innate immunity and now we have adaptive immunity. So we're going to be talking about, you know, if something gets into our body, if we're not able to stop it from spreading further, um, what can we learn from it? What is it telling us and how can we recognize it in the future? So this is the premise of vaccines, of immunization. Um, so we have this idea that we get exposed to some bacterium, some virus, some pathogen. We learn from it, we adapt to it, and our body is better able to respond to it in the future. Um, and if we have that memory component, we can respond very quickly and very intensely.
So again, um, even though we talked about cytokines already, these are also involved in adaptive immunity. Um, cytokines generally are a family of tons of different proteins. They're produced by lots of different immune cells, and they're important for communication between different types of immune cells. Um, when cytokines kind of get out of control, when they um, have this positive feedback loop that keeps their production going, that is called a cytokine storm, and it can be very dangerous because cytokines are involved in so many intense signaling processes. Um, this happens in really severe cases of the flu, as well as Ebola and sepsis. So like I mentioned, um, the immune system is really dependent on this memory component. And the memory is kind of formed when we get exposed to certain parts of the bacterium or the virus of the pathogen. So antigens are what we call um, antibody generators. That's what it, it means. Um, so antigens are coming from the bacteria or the virus. They're uh, kind of a signal that is on those different um, components. So they might be proteins or sugars from those pathogens. So they're small little pieces. Antigens are very small by default, um, and they might have different patterns to them, um, but they're pretty unique to the bacteria, virus, fungi, protist in question. In response to those antigens, our body produces antibodies. Um, so antibodies are produced by us in response to the antigens. Antigens are antibody generators that are coming from pathogens. Um, so these antibodies are kind of Y-shaped and they fit in, they kind of fit together like Lego pieces with the antigens. Um, they bind to specific antigens and they're secreted by plasma cells, which are a special type of B cell or actually attached to B cells. Um, we say that human antibodies are bivalent. They look like the letter Y, so you can see them pictured there. So when we get exposed to pathogens, um, we start to learn from them. And then when we have another exposure, when we have this memory response, it's very quick, very intense, because we've already been exposed to them. We already know what they are and how to fight them. Um, and so while a lot of white blood cells uh, kind of get phased out and die after a period of days or weeks, um, memory cells might stick around for years or even decades. Um, and then after uh, they get exposed to that antigen again, they're able to reproduce. Um, they don't reproduce regularly. It's only when they get exposed to that antigen again. And we can measure the amount of antibody in our blood serum to kind of know whether we've been exposed to something before. Um, so for example, a lot of people right now are scared of measles because a lot of people aren't getting their MMR vaccines for measles measles, mumps, and rubella, which are very important to protect you. Um, and so uh, you can go to the doctor and you could do an antibody titer to see if you have protection from the measles virus. That's also very important because, um, you know, there's a lot of things where it's like, oh, you know, just let them get exposed to it in nature. They'll get uh, protection the same way. Um, but it's important to remember that with vaccines, we, uh, we get protection without having to get sick. And so that is super important if you have someone like a baby or even an adult, because no one likes being sick. And a lot of the stuff that we think about as being um, you know, not too serious is actually really bad. Um, so like measles, it looks uncomfortable, but a lot of people might be like, oh, it's you know just like having the flu or having chicken pox. No, so it turns out measles actually destroys your immune systems. It destroys a lot of these memory cells. So you lose all of your um, acquired immunity, your adaptive immunity um, for other conditions as well. So it really, really knocks you out um, and you have to start from scratch. So there's a lot of things that can be really serious. Um, there's you know stuff like mumps, which can cause uh, sterility in people with testes. Um, so these are there's reasons why we have vaccines for them. So when we're thinking about antibodies, um, they might act in different ways. Uh, they, you know, they're maybe floating around our body, secreted from plasma cells. They might be um, attached to cells. But when they meet up with their corresponding antigen, there's a few different things they can do. They can bind to the target. They can bind to that antigen. 
um, they might tag the pathogen for phagocytosis, which means that they kind of send a signal like, hey, macrophage, come over here, um, consume this bacteria, we don't want it in our body anymore. Um, or they can cause other general responses like inflammation or lysis of the pathogen, um, kind of splitting open of the pathogen. So within adaptive immunity, we have two different systems. So remember, in innate immunity, we had the first line of defense before anything gets into our body. We had the second line of defense, which was nonspecific general reactions. In adaptive immunity, we have humoral immunity and we have cellular immunity. So I'll explain those words in just a moment, um, but humoral immunity kind of has more to do with B cells, uh, which are a type of lymphocytes. Um, so antibodies are released by the B cells, which are produced in bone marrow. So B for bone marrow. And they circulate through extracellular fluids. So think about humoral and fluids, um, and they recognize different antigens. Cellular immunity uh, is taken advantage of when um, different pathogens actually get into cells. So if the pathogens are just floating around in fluid, we use humoral immunity. If the pathogens get into our cells, we use cellular immunity. And cellular immunity is based primarily with on T cells or T lymphocytes, which mature in the thymus. Um, so these respond to antigens that are presented by, to them by the B cells, um, and they can destroy target cells that maybe have different viruses or intracellular pathogens inside of them or trigger bigger responses. So again, um, humors is, uh, again, you should think about fluids because humors is an old fashioned way of saying body fluids. So humoral immunity is taking place extracellularly. It's taking place outside of the cells, in plasma, in interstitial fluid, in lymph. Um, so all of those different locations. And again, we're focusing here primarily on B cells as part of humoral immunity. So B cells actually circulate through your lymph, they circulate through lymphatic vessels, they're kind of floating around um, until they come into contact with an antigen that matches them. So remember those antibodies match particular antigens um, and they have these receptors all over their bodies, those antibodies that, that are kind of sticking out. Um, so they come into contact with those antigens. When that happens, um, you know, you can have an antigen antibody response. Um, the B cells might make more of themselves um, or they make more antibodies. So they're um, in the case of memory B cells, they're making uh, more antibodies that are attached to those membrane uh, bound cells. Um, and then uh, in the case of plasma B cells, they're just producing more free antibodies to float around your bloodstream or your lymph. So for T cells with cellular immunity, remember that's if the pathogen gets into your cells. Um, so humoral immunity is extracellular, T cells target intracellular pathogens. So viruses, really tiny bacteria, um, and then also things like parasites, which are actually much, much bigger than bacteria. So you would have to get into the cells of the parasites in order to break it down. So there's a lot of different types of antigen presenting cells and T cells that are involved here. There's helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, T regulatory cells. Um, I'm not gonna have you go into depth in the mechanism for any of them. Just know that T cells are generally involved in cellular immunity. Um, one example though are the cytotoxic T cells. Um, this example is CD8 T cells. These are pretty cool because they can uh, kind of recognize a cell as being different from themselves, bind to it and interact with it, um, and then they inject this substance called perforin. Um, so think about perforating and opening up something. So basically it's gonna put a bunch of holes into the cell membrane of this pathogen, and then it's gonna explode. So uh, we call this apoptosis or programmed cell death. In this case, we're protecting our body from different pathogens, um, but in a lot of cases, apoptosis is just a normal part of the uh, cell life cycle. Um, our cells don't live forever. They're you know, constantly turning over. And so apoptosis is a normal part of their life cycle as well. There's also these guys called natural killer cells or NK cells, which are a type of lymphocyte. So these are large granular leukocytes. 
that are involved in cellular immunity. Um, so they can target cells, um, our cells that have been infected with virus. They can target tumor cells. Um, so remember, tumors um, are basically cells that have out of control mitosis or cell division. Um, so they can stop those cells before they damage the rest of our cells. And they can also attack parasites, which are things like worms that are larger than bacteria. Um, so they're non-specific; they are not stimulated by an antigen. Um, but because they're targeting uh, cells that have been infected, they are part of cellular immunity. Um, so they can distinguish uh, normal cells from cells that are infected with intracellular pathogens. So they um, kind of fit both into innate and adaptive immunity, which is why they were in that center portion of the Venn diagram at the beginning of the slideshow. They're both non-specific but also recognizing self versus non-self. So this slide is also important for you to keep in mind. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we acquire adaptive immunity. So if we acquire it naturally, it means uh, that there's something biological that we're doing to get this immunity. If we acquire it artificially, it means that a doctor um, or someone in a clinical setting is providing us with immunity. If it's active, it means that we're still initiating and engaging our immune system in some way. If it's passive, it means that the antibodies have already been made and are being given to us directly. So let's look at these different examples. For naturally acquired active immunity, that's like when you fall, scrape your knee, a bunch of bacteria gets in, they have antigens, they enter the body naturally, your body starts producing antibodies in response to those and engaging different lymphocytes. So now you have adaptive immunity that was naturally acquired and you were an active participant in that. For naturally acquired passive immunity, um, this is like if you are pregnant and you pass antibodies that you have produced through natural active means directly to your fetus. So the baby doesn't have to do anything to get those um, those uh, different antibodies, but it's still a natural process. This also happens in the transmission of milk. Um, and something that's so cool is when uh, when you're breastfeeding, the, it creates a vacuum and baby spit actually goes into your mammary glands as well. So then your body starts learning like, okay, what antigens are present in the baby? Um, what can I produce to make the baby healthier? And so then your body actually produces antibodies in response to antigens that are in the baby's saliva, which is crazy and amazing to me. Um, for artificially acquired adaptive immunity, the active portion of that is kind of like vaccines. So you get injected with a vaccine. Um, that vaccine has antigens. It might have, you know, an inactivated bacteria or virus. It might just have a piece of them. It might have a piece of their toxins. But that encourages your body to start reacting the way it would if you fell and scraped your knee. So it's still an active process. It's just artificially instigated, artificially acquired. And then if um, someone has purified antibodies in a lab and those are injected directly into you, that's passive artificially acquired adaptive immunity. So if I gave you any one of those examples in those bottom uh, parts of the flow chart, you should identify them as whether they're natural or artificial and also whether they're active or passive for the next quiz. So another thing to consider is that our immune system isn't always kept in careful balance. Um, different things like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease recognize, um, represent situations in which our immune system kind of gets out of control. Um, so hypersensitivity, autoimmune diseases, um, reactions to transplantation and immunodeficiencies are all problems uh, that our immune system might have if it's too strong or too weak. So just a couple of examples of hypersensitivities. Uh, allergies are something that most people in the Central Valley are very familiar with. Um, this is when your body has way too strong of a reaction to a foreign substance. So for example, um, mold or grasses start getting really active or pollen, um, or that we breathe in the pollen, it gets into our body, and then our body just goes crazy with the histamines and the neutrophils and different reactions. Um, and so it starts reacting very abnormally to those substances. Um, so we have an immune response that's disproportionately high.
In autoimmunity, that's when we have another disproportionately high immune response, but it's against our own cells. So our body is not able to recognize like, hey, those are actually my cells, I shouldn't be attacking them. Um, so allergies are hypersensitivity to a foreign substance. Autoimmune conditions are hypersensitivity to a non-foreign substance, which is our own body tissue. Okay, so please make sure you look over the last quiz feedback, listen to these lectures. Um, the study guide is already posted since I am posting the second lecture a little bit late. Um, the slides though and the focus points have been posted uh, for a while, so please make sure you look over those. Um, email me if you have any questions or concerns. The online reflection is also posted and the quiz will be available from Monday to Wednesday.